Coding is one of the areas where AI agents appear most advanced and most ready for prime time. And some new OpenAI research has set out to create a new benchmark for understanding how good these tools actually are. Welcome back to the AI Daily Brief. If you've been anywhere near AI Twitter slash X over the last few weeks, you've probably heard this term vibe coding. It was coined by OpenAI co-founder Andre Karpathy, who said, there's a new kind of coding I call vibe coding, where you fully give in to the vibes, embrace exponentials, and forget that the code even exists. It's possible because the LLMs, e.g. Cursor Composer with Sonnet, are getting too good. Also, I just talked to Composer with Super Whisper, so I barely even touch the keyboard. I ask for the dumbest things, like decrease the padding on the sidebar by half, because I'm too lazy to find it. I accept all always. I don't read the diffs anymore. When I get error messages, I just copy-paste them in with no comment. Usually that fixes it. The code grows beyond my usual comprehension. I'd have to really read through it for a while. Sometimes the LLMs can't fix a bug, so I just work around it or ask for random changes until it goes away. It's not too bad for throwaway weekend projects, but still quite amusing. I'm building a project or a web app, but it's not really coding. I just see stuff, say stuff, run stuff, and copy-paste stuff, and it mostly works. Now, this, as we will discuss, has begun an entire movement of vibe coders who are thinking about new categories of tools, and it's predicated, as Carpathy points out, on the availability of a particular set of new coding tools that hit that line right between LLMs and agents in terms of how much they're being controlled by humans and how much they're actually doing for themselves. Indeed, I think part of what makes this area so interesting is that it is really at the forefront of agents in practice. It demonstrates, on the one hand, how mushy some of this terminology is, but at the same time, how powerful these tools are likely to be in practice. All right, so part of the context for today's show is vibe coding. But then another little bit of background is the conversation we were having yesterday about Grok 3. When Grok 3 launched, it showed off how it had done on a bunch of benchmarks. And I, like many people, found myself basically just having my eyes glaze over when it came to those benchmarks because they're so saturated at this point that it's really hard to actually get signal from them. As Ethan Mollick pointed out, public benchmarks are both meh and saturated, leaving a lot of AI testing to be like food reviews based on taste. If AI is critical to work, we need more. He also pointed out that a lot of these benchmarks, quote, look nothing like actual work. And given that we spend all of our time over at Superintelligent on the actual deployment and practice of AI and agents at work, this is a particularly poignant problem. It's also not an easy one. Another reminder from just this morning from Ethan, AI is so challenging to figure out because it's genuinely capable of doing PhD level work in some areas while messing up basic tasks in closely related areas. And the abilities of AI are growing, but unevenly. All right, so all of this is background to our main topic today, which is a new benchmark from OpenAI called the SWE Lancer Benchmark. The gist and the question that provoked the whole conversation was, can Frontier LLMs earn $1 million from real-world freelance software engineering? Earlier this week, OpenAI released a paper effectively seeking to test how competent their leading models are in real-world coding applications. This new SWE Lancer Benchmark consists of, quote, over 1,400 freelance software engineering tasks from Upwork valued at $1 million in USD total in real-world payouts. SWE Lancer encompasses both independent engineering tasks ranging from $50 bug fixes to $32,000 feature implementations, and managerial tasks where models choose between technical implementation proposals. So why is this important? Well, this gets at exactly what we were just discussing. Until now, coding benchmarks have largely involved competitive coding problems. These are tests that assess models on tricky programming puzzles but don't translate directly into practical real-world use cases. On top of their inapplicability to the real world, they're also, as we just mentioned, becoming increasingly saturated, making it difficult to know whether a new model represents a significant improvement or was simply trained to perform well on a known set of questions. This benchmark, then, is much more focused on the real world. And it actually harkens back to an idea that some, like Microsoft's Mustafa Suleiman, have proposed for a new type of Turing test based on how AI interacts with the real world. Back in the middle of 2023, Mustafa Silliman proposed a Turing test of whether AI could make a million dollars. Mustafa wrote, I think we're in a moment of genuine confusion or perhaps more charitably debate about what's really happening. Even as the Turing test fails, it doesn't leave us much clearer on where we are with AI or what it can actually achieve. It doesn't tell us what impact these systems will have on society or help us understand how that will play out. His proposal then for a modern Turing test would be to give AI the instruction Go make a million dollars on a retail web platform in a few months with just a $100,000 investment. So this is a little bit different, obviously, than what OpenAI had done, in that OpenAI is specifically giving the model these 1,400 freelance tasks, rather than asking it to go be creative and figure out how to make that money. 
But the principle of getting benchmarks into the real world, plus this baselining to a million dollars, obviously are reminiscent. Getting back to Sui Lancer, for the purposes of this paper, the researchers set three LLMs to the task. They tested OpenAI's GPT-40 and O1 alongside Anthropic's Claude 3.5 Sonnet. Each LLM was driving a basic coding agent capable of directly interacting with a code base. The models were given one shot to complete each task. Overall, researchers found that, quote, the results indicate that the real-world freelance work in our benchmarks remains challenging for frontier language models. Going even farther in the abstract, they write, we find that frontier models are still unable to solve the majority of tasks. Providing a little more clarity on the tasks themselves, they were scraped directly from Upwork and Expensify with no word changes or clarification, giving the models a taste of real-world freelancing work. The models were also denied internet access, including GitHub, ensuring that they were working based solely on their pre-trained dataset. However, they did have access to a snapshot of the code bases they were working on. The results found that none of the models had earned a million dollars as an automated freelancer. Interestingly, though, despite the fact that this research was from OpenAI, Claude 3.5 Sonnet performed the best, resolving 26% of individual contributor issues and earning $89,000 out of a possible $415,000. For individual contributor tasks, O1 came in second place, earning $78,000 while GPT-40 performed less well, earning 29000 As interesting as the results, though, was the analysis. The report explained, Agents excel at localizing but fail to root cause, resulting in partial or flawed solutions. Agents pinpoint the source of an issue remarkably quickly, using keyword searches across the whole repository to quickly locate the relevant file and functions, often far faster than a human would. However, they often exhibit a limited understanding of how the issue spans multiple components or files, and fail to address the root cause, leading to solutions that are incorrect or insufficiently comprehensive. We rarely find cases where the agent aims to reproduce the issue or fails due to not finding the right file or location to edit. For the managerial tasks, each model displayed better performance. Claude 3.5 Sonnet was again the best performing model, earning 314,000 of a possible 585,000, completing 54% of tasks. O1 was hot on its heels, correctly completing 52% of tasks for a total of 302,000. And even GPT-40 bringing up the rear still managed 47% of tasks to earn 275000 This showed that the models were all decent at choosing the right solution when presented with several options, but still have a long way to go until they can fully replace a technical lead. Overall, Claude 3.5 Sonnet won the day, earning 403000 overall with a 40% completion rate. O1 earned 380000 while completing 38% of the full set of tasks, and GPT-40 finished 30% of tasks earning 304000 now, to be clear, no money was actually earned. These tasks were all simulated, but that's how much they would have earned had the AI actually been in charge of that job from Upwork or Expensify. Part of what's so interesting about this, and we'll get to this in a moment in the commentary, is that this absolutely reflects the broad consensus that people have had for some time, which is that Claude 3.5 Sonnet is just by far and away the best coding model. We've even talked about how its ubiquity as the coding model created some challenges for Anthropic's economic report, given what a high percentage of Claude's use comes from those coding use cases. Now, in terms of commentary and the response to this so far, a lot of it is focusing on exactly this weird contrast that we've identified. Mihir Patel writes, There's increasingly a difference between academic benchmarks and real-world use cases. How are O1 and O3 top competitive programmers yet still worse than Sonnet 3.5 on Sweet Lancer and Cursor AI? As always, evals remain hard and messy, and still, somehow, Sonnet is the best code model. Benjamin DeCracker, who was previously on the team at XAI but fired for saying that Grok3 wasn't the second coming, noted that it was bold of OpenAI to show that Claude 3.5 Sonnet outperformed O1 on their own benchmark. Synthetica Lab responded, I'm not benchmarking, but in a real project that I'm working on in C++. O1 was basically unusable. They then went to share their experience with O1, Claude 3.5, and Grok3, Again, pointing out that these benchmarks are really not necessarily useful for understanding how things are going to work in the real world. Another interesting comment came from Henry Shi, the founder of Super.com. He pointed out that in a previous experiment that he had run that was very similar, while they had reached the same conclusion that, quote, frontier models are still unable to solve the majority of tasks, he also wrote, what's interesting and underappreciated in the paper is that O1 is able to solve almost 50% of all IC suite tasks on the Upwork benchmark. This makes sense as human freelancers rarely get the solution right on the first try. There's a lot of back and forth and clarification required with the client. If AI agents are able to effectively iterate on a problem, it should be able to drastically improve performance, just like humans and feedback in the workplace as well. In other words, for the sake of this benchmark, these model-powered agents were given a single chance to do it. That's not actually how it would work in the real world. And so as the user experience and interactive capabilities of agents go up, 
it's likely that in real-world settings they'd be able to even outperform where they got during this test. Another thing that some pointed out was the likelihood that this means that OpenAI is actually building an end production coding agent. Developer Nick Dobos writes, if they took the time to build a benchmark, it means they are building a product to test an agent against it. We haven't talked about this all that much on this show, but I'm fairly certain that in a world where it's increasingly clear that the underlying models are going to be commoditized and that there's not going to be much moat when it comes to technology, I think OpenAI has a much stronger incentive to own the customer experience end to end. And my guess is that they are looking at agents in just about every key domain of work. Now, going back to this broader idea of vibe coding, I wanted to flag just how big a theme this has gotten to be. Like I said, I think that coding is one of the areas where agents are coming to production and actually being deployed for businesses most quickly. And I think that this whole idea of vibe coding is really fleshing out the spectrum of code creation from no code all the way to coding agents, all the way to traditional coding experiences. A16Z recently did a new market map of these types of tools. People like Riley Brown, who's the number one AI creator on TikTok, has gone all in on vibe coding, even working on some tools to improve how people do their vibe coding now. He also shared some interesting thoughts recently about how this might change the structure of the economy. Specifically, he points out that as creators can monetize their audiences with software rather than things like courses and ads, it creates a very different type of economic opportunity, one that's starting to be reflected in a new generation of VC creator funds. And speaking of VCs, it's very clear that there is lots of interest in this area. A16Z's Andrew Chen tweets, Who is building the product that's 100% focused on vibe coding? It needs to have built-in highly primitive G-Slides level drawing tools, Spotify integration for background music, library of pre-existing app UIs, so you can, for example, make the signup flow the same as XYZ app, explainers on highlighted code diffs, etc., library of graphic assets, integrated logo creator, and Andrew points out all the PMs and XPMs like me will have a field day with this. Point being that when we look at coding right now, not only are we talking about disruption to the way that coding happens among traditional software engineers, we're also talking about totally different modalities and an expansion of who gets to actually push code. At the same time, even as all of these people get excited about what they can do that they couldn't do before because they weren't coders, that's not the same as these tools being able to be inserted willy-nilly into enterprise code processes. And so a lot of the work over the next couple of years is going to be to figure out how these experiences diverge and what type of coding agents are good for different settings. Still, it is an absolutely fascinating time and I am very excited to see what comes next. For now, though, that is going to do it for today's AI Daily Brief. Appreciate you listening as always. And until next time, peace.